All right, great. Um, thanks a lot. I <clears throat> um, really appreciate the organizers for putting on this event, and I'm really excited to be here. Um, uh, love the talk so far from Jim and Wilbur, and, and looking forward to seeing more. Um, um, so, like I was said, I am uh, Cole Brokamp. Um, I'm from Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. Um, and I'm a assistant professor in biostatistics and epidemiology over there. Um, a lot of my research right now um, deals with environmental effects on um, neurobehavioral and psychiatric outcomes in kids. Um, but today, I'm excited to talk about some pure R stuff. So, what I'm calling three levels of computational mobility using R. Um, so, I'm really going to talk about kind of what I think computational mobility is and talk about some examples of this. Um, and then get into the three levels and, and kind of some high level overview of the different types of tools that are out there and approaches that people can take to achieve this. Um, and then I'll conclude with a little bit of discussion um, and some thoughts on, on the different levels. So um, I really came across the, the computational mobility term first um, by the authors of Singularity, which is a container framework that I'll, I'll mention later in the talk. But you know they have this great paper where they came out with Singularity um, in PLS1. <clears throat> and they said it's the ability to define, create, maintain a workflow locally while remaining confident that that workflow can be executed on different hosts. Um, and, you know, we just heard from Wilbur the great example of pulling code from your local computer, taking it to a different computer. And so the trick with, you know, the mobility, uh, computational mobility is that we want to be able to capture um, everything that we're doing, the entire software stack that could be the data, the code, the executables, the software libraries, um, not only be able to capture that, but reliably move it from system to system. Um, so that includes not only, you know, physically moving the files, but actually installing those packages and making sure that they're available and it works the same um, as it did when it was on your computer. And so what does this mean for our users, us as our users? Um, so really, <clears throat> what really comes to mind for me is, you know, versions of our packages, uh, versions of system dependencies, um, different data you might be using or input files to your code, and then R itself. Um, I think we all know or have experienced, you know, different versions of packages or system dependencies um, can give us different results using the same code. Um, and so, you know, in any field, not just let alone science, um, it's important to be able to kind of reproduce your code and have it work in other places um, the same as it does on your own machine. Um, and so computational mobility and reproducibility, you know, really go hand in hand. And, you know, almost consider mobility, computational mobility, um, a superset of reproducibility because you have to be able to move that, capture it, um, but then rerun it other places. Um, and so a lot of the techniques and the three levels I'm going to talk about today um, are applicable for scientific reproducibility, um, but they really go beyond that into anywhere where you want um, security and consistency um, with your code. Um, so, you know, the when I first heard the term computational mobility, I thought it seemed like kind of an esoteric thing. But you know, the more I got to thinking about these examples of when I'm going to be moving code from my computer to somewhere else, I realized that's a pretty common issue. Um, so my first example here would be, you know, if I'm running a, a code and I um, realize I don't have enough RAM on my computer and I want to use the Ohio Supercomputing Center, um, I'd call up Wilbur, get an account. Um, and so my, my first, you know, thing would be, how am I going to move my code and get all the same packages and the same versions, everything there, so it'll run um, the same on the, the cluster as it does on my local computer. Um, another example could be sending a project to a collaborator. <clears throat> this could be, um, you know, just emailing a zip file of code, or it could be on GitHub. You know, when two people are working on the same R project, how are you um, able to actually ensure that you're using the same package libraries. So when you work on that code, um, you'll get the same results and not have to waste time figuring out why um, the code isn't producing the same results on two different machines. Um, deploying a Shiny application. I know we have a couple of Shiny relevant talks today, um, but you know, obviously um, I, I think a lot of the container technologies were, were first created for deploying applications. Um, so Shiny is a big one. When we create a Shiny application on our own computer, we want to make sure that it works the same, obviously. Um, it doesn't change um, when, when users are, are using those applications. Deploying R code to a continuous integration server um, <clears throat> or any type of server, you know, a lot of times we'll use um, API, use the Palmer package in R um, to be able to serve our prediction models um, inside data pipelines in our, in our organizations. Um, so that's obviously a big one. Um, the other one, 
um, is you know, a favorite of mine for science, which is running a project that contains code written several years ago with an older version of R. So I think you know, most people have probably had the experience where they try to dig up an old package and, or sorry, an old project, um, and then they need to install this older package to get it to run. And it becomes an issue getting something to rerun, um, whether that's revisiting a project um, or, or updating some results. Um, and then you know, kind of the extension of that is to create a research compendium um, to ensure the reproducibility of your project. So this kind of um, is a little bit more related to scientific approaches, but <clears throat> excuse me, really creating a whole compendium so that someone can reproduce your results, um, your scientific paper, given your input data, and then to make that code available for others to play around with and use. And then finally, um, if you want to put your R projects into a Docker or Singularity container, um, so you'll see, I'll talk about those as one of the levels, but we can also use some of these other tools to help us facilitate that, that translation. Okay, so jumping in um, to the three levels. So the kind of the first level, I would consider using static package repositories. Um, you know, when we install R packages inside R into our library, um, there the code is downloaded from some online repository to get those. Um, <clears throat> and if we use CRAN or the default um, repository installing R packages, it'll always install the latest um, pa package version, um, which is a, which is a good thing. Um, but there are times where we want to ensure that the same package version gets installed every time. Um, and so the RStudio package manager, um, the Microsoft Revolution Analytics, um, MRAN Time Machine are both um, repositories that take static snapshots of CRAN um, on certain days. Um, and so the way you would implement this in R is through you know, setting your repos option to change your repository. And you can see here at the bottom, um, there's a little code snippet where you would insert a date. And so basically the idea is if you could, you know, you've installed your packages from CRAN on that given date, and then you know, a year or two or later, or you send it over to someone else, they will set that um, same repository and will result within all the same packages there. Um, and there's also kind of an extension here um, where you can kind of make your own repository. I know a lot of um, scientific companies and, and startups do this to so where they have a centralized repository where they control the versions. So everyone is installing them, will be on the same versions and can be really interoperable. And so the major advantage is, you know, package installations will always use the same versions. And this is great, this is exactly what we want. It doesn't really require a lot of any extra helper tools or infrastructure or our packages and it's really low implementation overhead you know um it, it's just one thing but it is maybe a disadvantage so we have to rely on a user to set that repository themselves um, and including that in your script and reinstalling the packages um, sometimes can interfere with other project libraries so if you are have two different R projects in your computer and one of them you want to install an older version of a package um, that could impact the functionality of a different R package on that same computer if you're using kind of the standard setup with a shared library across all our projects. Um, <clears throat> I have here that only CRAN packages are supported. I know that's no longer true with RStudio Package Manager, um, but that is a limitation with MRAN. Um, <clears throat> and then perhaps one of the, the biggest things is, you know, because we can simplify this all down to one date, that, that's a great advantage to be able just to specify a date. Um, but on the flip side, you know, that means that all of our package versions have to be on CRAN on that same date. So we're going to kind of pick that snapshot date and use that. And there are workarounds to use different MRAN snapshots for different package installations. Um, but I think if you're getting there, you might want to think about going up to level two or three. Um, and then the big one is, you know, it doesn't track system dependencies or versions of R itself. Um, so, you know, it, it might be unlikely, but it is possible that R will have different behavior depending on different versions of R itself. Um, and then if you're using a lot of system dependencies, um, myself, I do a lot of geospatial work, and so I'm relying on geospatial system libraries um, that change. Um, the Proj4 update recently is a great example of how you're going to get unexpected behavior without changing an R package version, but just by changing the underlying system dependency. So the level one would not, you know, fix that problem. So level two um, is what I'm calling helper packages. And these kind of packages really um, use a specific file that are dedicated to documenting versions of your code. Um, and so the way they do that is to, you, know, you can either automatically or manually um, manage your dependencies. And so I have um, two packages here. Um, the R environment package from RStudio, I highly recommend it. 
um, has, I've kind of ended up, you know, using that and superseding my own package that was called DEP in my, in my own workflow. Um, so both of these packages can scan through your code, look for calls of library, um, calling out specific functions, different things you want to import, um, and will identify the packages that are needed. Um, and then they'll peek into your library and see what version you have installed and then completely document that. And so our studio, or our, env our environment, excuse me, uses this through an our environment lock file. And you can use our environment snapshot and restore um, to snapshot uh, the packages that are required to run your code and you have installed in your library. And then once you move um, that lock file over to another machine, you can simply run restore and it will reinstall all of those packages with the exact same versions. The same thing goes for the debt package. Um, it uses a description file. Uh, we're probably familiar with those, you know, uses the Debian control format, um, but is in our packages. And, and, you know, so I think a lot of us, when we write our packages now, you might see um, we require or import this package and it must be at least this version. Um, so we can simply tailor that to say it must be identical to this version. Um, there's similar functions here where you can call depends and deploy um, to automatically pick those up. And then the really, the, one of the key advantages is that this is a private library specific to your R project. Um, so that means that anytime you start R and that R project, these packages use a project specific R profile that will let R know that you're in a project and you want to use just that private library in that folder for that project. So if you want to install a really old package um, and you, you don't have to be afraid you're going to break anything else on your computer. If you want to install a you know, newer version of a package um, and try it out and it breaks things, then you can easily roll back without affecting anything else. And so the advantages there are, you know, you can use any package repository in any package version, you know, GitHub, CRAN, Bioconductor, it, it pulls in those different um, packages and can really tell where they are, and, you know, identify the specific commit hash on GitHub and pull out the exact version that you want. And then, um, you know, if we're, we're, we're literally using version control for our versions here. So we can keep these files, these description files, these lock files under version control. Um, so we can decide when we want to update our packages. And then when that is updated, um, if you're collaborating or using that um, on GitHub, um, someone can pull down, you know, that file and then restore the project and update the packages. And so, you know, you kind of track new features or bug fixes to your code along with the changes in the dependencies. And you can see that right there. And that makes it easy to, you know, get blame or, or look and see where maybe updating the dependency might have broken your process. And then, like I said, using a private library really isolates your R project from other things. Um, and not only on your own computer, um, this is a big advantage for Shiny apps where you might be using Shiny server um, to host more than one application. And you want to make sure that both applications don't have to rely on the same library. Um, and these do track system dependencies. So actually they use the, um, an R package, uh, Sysrex, which is a database of system requirements um, required for each of these individual packages. And um, they'll either manually suggest that you install these dependencies or um, in some cases can kind of give you the code on different platforms that you would need to install these things. Um, maybe one minor downside is you might, it does require a little bit of infrastructure code setup. So both of them require a project specific R profile um, and a little bit of boilerplate that goes in there. Um, uh, but in, in my experience, that really hasn't been a downside. Once, once you get on top of it, um, it's great. Um, they're kind of self bootstrapping. If you start your R project, especially with our environment, it will recognize that, hey, our environment's not installed. I don't have a private library and it'll install it for you. Um, but you know, maybe the downside is, you know, even though we're capturing the specific versions of these packages, we still have to rely on them being available online. And so usually this isn't a problem, but you know, if a, if a binary disappears off CRAN or a GitHub pa uh, package online is no longer existent, um, we won't be able to run that code anymore unless it was saved somewhere else. So this kind of brings me to the, the third level, <clears throat> which are containers. Um, and I'm just gonna go high level over kind of what they are. Um, and so I think, you know, you can think of a container as kind of like a virtual machine. Um, but it's a lot lighter work framework. And so they're much faster to start and stop and a lot more scalable. And what it basically is, is, you know, we, we can see it almost mirrors the definition of computational mobility because that's what in effect they were created to do. Um, so they contain the entire software stack. So it has everything um, from the ground up from your operating system 
including all your code, executables, R packages, and software libraries. And then <clears throat> these um, different container frameworks use definition files um, to bootstrap the entire environment. So, <clears throat> excuse me, for Docker, for example, we can use a Docker file um, to maybe say we want to start from an Ubuntu machine and then we want to install R, um, install R packages, add our code, um, install the, you know, the code that we have and run that and get an output. And so common frameworks here are Docker um, is probably the most widely used one. Um, Singularity is one that is really great for high performance computing. We use that a lot um, because Docker has some security brute escalation privilege issues. And so Singularity was really a container system designed to work on a high performance cluster. Um, so in places where you're using shared computing, it's a huge advantage in the open, open container initiative. Um, and then there are several, I'm not going to get into it here, um, but several R packages for auto-generating these Docker files, Singularity files, for creating and running containers um, and, and managing Docker. There really is, a, you know, a big ecosystem out there. And so, you know, the advantage of is you have a complete isolation from your operating system. You know, it, it really is guaranteed to run anywhere at the, the same. Um, and if you have the entire image, the, the large image that you create, the container, um, you don't have internet required to restore your environment. You can just be up and running. Um, and you can use this to for long-term archival storage of your projects. And then being a single file, um, it's a little bit easier to move between systems. Um, <clears throat> the, the big downside is it does require this container software on your host. Um, that's been the biggest hurdle um, for you know getting other users to adopt this, um, especially within um, scientific communities. Um, a lot of people were uh, maybe novice R users might get a little finicky um, when you start telling them how to go into early startup mode and bio settings and, and change their virtualization permissions. Um, and it really is a little bit more development effort. I mean, you have to work on your definition file, test that, run that, um, and, and maintain that at the same time. Um, and they can be rel relatively large file size. Um, you can combat that by using the definition file to simply rebuild your container um, but again, you might run into the same problems whereby if you're not specifying the package dependencies in there, you could end up with a different container. Um, so just to wrap up here, you know, what is the best approach? And, you know, I don't know if there is a single best approach. I think um, some of the considerations would be the types of R packages that you need to document. You know, are you using GitHub packages? Are you using development versions of several packages, older versions of CRAN packages? and how much of an impact would a wrong package version have on your project. And then to think about the environment, you know, if we're on a high performance computing cluster, we might only have access to Singularity or might have to ask someone to install packages or the collaborator you're sending it to, are they familiar and confident in being able to use um, container frameworks or these helper packages. Um, and then really it boils down to, I think the balance between reproducibility versus complexity is the more, um, you know, reproducible we want our environment to be is a little bit more complexity that we have to install um, ourselves to, to make that possible. Um, and then, like I said before, so these levels can, are not, you know, just three choices. They can work together and separately. So we can use a container and use an MRAN snapshot date, or we could use the R environment package to install our package. Um, you know, but lastly, you want to make sure that the framework you're using and the tools you're using are stable and sustainable um, so you can ensure that your, your science and your code really is reproducible um, in the long term. Um, so I will stop right there um, and I would love to take any questions. Thanks everybody for your time. Awesome, excellent job, uh, Cole. We, we really appreciate that and, and I love, it's kind of, you know, larger software engineering approach to, you know, getting, <clears throat> making R scalable and, you know, uh, making it fit whatever kind of uh, needs you have. Um, I do want to just quickly say that the break, the morning break does start right now. So if you want to, if anyone really needs to jump off, go ahead. But I do want to give Cole a chance to answer these questions. So if you want to stick around and listen to them, that'd be awesome too. Um, so the first question here is asking about, um, if you believe that the tidyverse is making mobility a bit more challenging. Um, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. You know, one of the early issues that I found is um, a lot of times when I, you know, fire up my first R project, I do a library tidyverse, right? And we go in. Um, but, you know, what I found um, is that, you know, later we'll go in and we'll pick through which tidyverse, you know, dependencies we actually need. 
Um, and so that's actually a problem that would be great to automate is to, you know, when we want to pull out tidyverse because we're only using dplyr and tidyr, you know, I think that would be great. Um, you know, especially now with the um, binaries that are available through the RStudio package manager through Linux, it has improved the build times for our containers in order of magnitude. Um, so, you know, I think verse packages, and it's not just tidyverse, a lot of different verse packages out there that will install other packages. Um, as long as you get up the underlying code and what you need, I, I don't think um, it's, it's a huge barrier. Excellent. Um, here, let's see. Um, it says, do you know of any function that scans your project to detect libraries that, that are called but aren't actually being used to avoid uh, unnecessary dependence in your RN? Yeah, so I believe that our environment uh, in the snapshot package, there's a couple of different options you can set. Um, I think by default, our environment will only capture snapshot a package if it is installed in your library and exists in your code. Um, so if you have a package that you've installed manually in the, in the um, you know, our prompt, um, but it does not exist in your, in your code, um, there is a way to purge that out and get rid of it. Um, and that, that's, it. that's useful for times when you might have development dependencies that aren't necessarily deployment dependencies. So if you're using something like a language server for R or a, a linter or something like that, you know, that is, you want that to be available in your project library when you're working on your R code, but you don't want that to be developed. Um, so there are several options. Um, I think that was one of the bigger issues with Packrat, one of the older packages, um, was how those things were defined. And so there are very fine-tuned controls um, with what automatically gets captured and what manually gets captured. Awesome. Well, great talk, Cole. Um, uh, that is the end of our um, infrastructure sec uh, section. So we have a 20 minute break. So we'll be resuming at 11 with uh, session two, which is more of hobbies uh, that people are doing with their R. Uh, so yeah, you guys can hang out if you want or take a break and we'll resume here at 11.